So, uh, good morning to all those who have uh, joined in today morning. Uh, I have great pleasure on behalf of Idea Clinics to welcome all of you to this uh, very interesting program. I'm sure this is going to be a very useful and interesting program for all those who have joined here. Uh, this program is uh, being, uh, we have a very eminent faculty uh, for this program. We have Dr. Siddharth Chakravarti, Dr. Vrinda Agarwal, and uh, Dr. Srinivas Panja, who are going to be uh, uh, speaking about different aspects of uh, thyroid ultrasonography in the evaluation of thyroid nodules. So thyroid nodules, as you know, are very common uh, disorders. I mean, they, are, they, are, they have very high prevalence to the tune of about, say, maybe uh, 5 to 10 percent of the population, or even when you look at uh, autopsy series, it may be much higher. So they are many a times they are silent. They can be picked up on uh, routine clinical examination, and uh, it is very important to understand. They have very sm a small percentage of these nodules could could turn malign could be malignant, and identifying the these malignant nodules from those. Uh, from the large majority which are benign is very important in terms of uh, the subsequent management because uh, we have good management strategies for for uh, even when we identify the malignant nodules and it is important to to uh, look at um, uh, the various uh, uh, tools that we have for uh, evaluating the thyroid nodule amongst the various tools that we have i think ultrasonography has uh, over the last few years emerged as a very useful tool in the assessment of thyroid nodules. And today we are focusing on, uh, I mean, while we'll be discussing about the thyroid nodule, we'll be focusing on ultrasonography as a very useful tool in assessment of the thyroid nodules. So without uh, taking much time, I would uh, now uh, introduce, like to introduce the three faculty members. Uh, Dr. Siddharth uh, Chakravarti is a uh, is an uh, endocrine surgeon who has, uh, who has uh, uh, qualified from uh, the prestigious uh, CMC uh, in, in Vellore. And uh, he has been associated with the Apollo Group of Hospitals and he's with the Idea Clinics uh, for the last uh, uh, more, than, more than two years uh, that he's been in Hyderabad now. And uh, we also have Dr. Vinda Agarwal, who's a uh, very eminent endocrinologist uh, who has uh, done her uh, residency in medicine and 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 a fellowship in in uh, endocrinology uh, from the us and has uh, been with us for the last uh, uh, four years uh, at idea clinics and she's also associated with the care group of hospitals in hyderabad we have dr srinivas panja also who is uh, joining us from the uh, uh, from uh, from the uh, United States of America, and he has been uh, associated with Idea Clinics uh, in all of, in all our programs. He has been a very active participant in all these programs. In his special interest has been in the field of uh, uh, thyroid uh, uh, disorders and particularly assessment of thyroid nodules. And he is going to uh, give us uh, very useful uh, uh, information today, and uh, we look forward to his participation in this program. So, with these few uh, words, I would. Uh, like to hand over to Dr. Siddharth to uh, coordinate the further proceedings. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, at the outset, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Rakesh Sahai and Dr. Uh, Sham Kalwalapalli, who are the main guiding and uh, driving force for organizing this. We wanted to uh, make this as a hands-on experience, but in view of the pandemic, uh, it, we are doing it as a webinar and hopefully by next year it should be a hands-on uh, for all of you. So we would uh, be talking about the basics of uh, ultrasound in this uh, program. The first talk will be by uh, Dr. Vrinda Agarwal. Uh, without much ado, I hand over uh, this to uh, Dr. Vrinda Agarwal. Ma'am, please. Um, thank you, Dr. Siddharth. I'm going to just share my screen now. Um... It says I am not able to actually share my presentation. Um, okay. Yeah, the host will have to enable multiple people to present. 
you can make the speakers as co-hosts. Avik, are you there? Yeah, multiple access is given. Can you please try? Yeah, uh, make the speakers as the co-hosts so that. All right. Um, so hi um, and good morning, everyone. I hope everybody uh, and their families are doing well. Um, so uh, I'm Dr. Vrinda and um, I appreciate the opportunity today to talk to you all about um, the principles of ultrasound and normal ultrasound anatomy of the thyroid. Um, so over the past decade or so, I think, you know, um, um, the role of thyroid ultrasound has been defined even more. It has become um, the single most valuable imaging modality in the evaluation of thyroid disease. Um, it's found its unique niche. And uh, when you talk about why so, um, so essentially it, the availability, the portability, um, it's very safe, it's non-invasive, there is no radiation associated with it. And you know, as the technology has advanced, um, now we have high resolution um, machines which are able to delineate um, you know, uh, lesions up to even like two millimeters. Um, the thyroid is superficial in um, a location, so that's why it makes us a good choice uh, for the utility in terms of uh, ultrasound imaging. Um, so add to it the Doppler, and then you're able to even identify, um, you know, um, the vasculature in the thyroid parenchyma, the nodules, or the lymph, at, um, the lymph nodes. So um, um, ideally, essentially, it has pushed away the use of um, um, the radionuclide imaging, which is now more restrictive um, to evaluation of conditions like hyperthyroidism. So, um, you know, uh, just keeping in line what Dr. Rakesh also mentioned that, um, you know, um, a large part of like the nodules are missed. Um, if you only uh, look at the data that we have available for um, ultrasound imaging versus palpation, a significant proportion of these nodules may be missed. In fact, now with the advent of, uh, you know, high resolution ultrasound imaging, now we have data that, you know, that corroborates with the autopsy data that almost about 18% of patients who were you know, uh, told that they had normal thyroid glands may have actually uh, a nodule which may be more than two centimeters. And people who were told that you have a single nodule may have a multinodular goiter. So um, palpation may actually not be accurate in up to 30% of uh, um, uh, patients with solitary nodules. So like the data that has been computed is, uh, you know, from the research says that 16% um, uh, would have had no corresponding ultrasound nodule on the ultrasound and 15% may have an additional non pable uh, nodule more than one centimeter on the ultrasound. In fact, you know, just to show you a couple of pictures here, this is the uh, transverse um, um, uh, section of the thyroid as, as seen on the ultrasound imaging. And what we see here is that um, 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 this is a fairly large uh, palpable nodule here, but look at the little nodule here, which is uh, deep into the parenchyma and often will escape uh, palpation. Uh, look at the another uh, other nodule here in this uh, picture. Again, a significantly larger nodule, but because of its deep location into the thyroid parenchyma, again, may be missed. So, um, you know, the data uh, that we have today says that, um, that if you compare ultrasound versus uh, palpation, um, there is a significant number of uh, nodules that may be, that may be missed uh, on palpation alone, uh, amounting to up to almost 93.8% uh, for the nodules that may be less than one centimeters. So, um, the role of ultrasound has been more defined these days. You know, it essentially, um, you know, is being used to um, outline the anatomic features of the thyroid nodules to uh, essentially that is where, you know, the talk is going to progress further, how it may actually help identify um, benign versus malignant nodules, how it may assist in the fine needle aspiration of these, um, you know, um, suspicious nodules, then also to monitor nodular disease. So over time, uh, and then uh, planning for uh, thyroid cancer surgeries where evaluation of lymph nodes uh, essentially becomes very important. Then also to um, assist in the surveillance of recurrence um, in patients with uh, history of thyroid cancer who are say post uh, total thyroidectomy, radioactive iodine treatment, and then to screen for the presence of thyroid nodules in high risk groups, those with a history of childhood radiation, et cetera. Um, so across the globe, um, the guidelines now endorse, um, like the American Thyroid Association, American College of Endocrinology, the European Thyroid Association, that um, there is a significant utility um, 
uh, in uh, um, uh, utilizing um, the ultrasound for um, evaluation of palpable thyroid nodules or those with a history of um, uh, multinodular goiter. And again, as I mentioned, um, um, there is a strong recommendation for uh, using uh, thyroid ultrasound in patients with um, uh, who are at a high risk of developing nodular disease. Uh, those considered to be high risk are um, those with a history of familial thyroid cancer, men type two, or um, history of head and neck radiation. And then if they have any uh, concern for lymph nodes that may be suggestive of head and neck malignancy. So um, I um, I am a history buff. So as I was trying, as I was preparing this talk, I wanted to look into the history of um, ultrasound. So if you um, read about it, it is interesting that actually um, acoustics, which is the science of sound, was um, uh, you know finds mention um, um, in uh, like. Uh, papers as old as like 6th century BC by Pythagoras, who actually um, wrote down the mathematics for stringed uh, instruments. But then when we talk about the modern age, essentially it started in 1877 when the theory of sound book was published, which outlined the principles um, underlying the physics of sound and then uh, gave us an idea that how um, the reflected sound may be utilized for locating objects. Then after the Titanic sank uh, in 1912, um, uh, increasingly the sonar technology was being utilized um, to um, you know, uh, detect an iceberg. And then subsequently this found a way in, uh, uh, um, in uh, locating submarines in World War I and World War II. Um, then um, when, you talk, when you look into the history of ultrasound being utilized um, in the medical field, it started somewhere in 1940s. And then when you look at um, you know, when it started, uh, when the ultrasound imaging uh, start being, uh, was being used for thyroid imaging, the mention is somewhere in 1960s when the first report of ultrasound assessment of the thyroid appeared. Um, and then um, now, as we've moved across, of course, you know, we've uh, refined our technology. And now, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, with the advent of Doppler ultrasound uh, back in 1980s, we are even um, able, we are able to even visualize um, the vasculature in the thyroid parenchyma. So um, <clears throat> while on this topic, I think it's very, very important. I, I, um, I um, you know, I've been trained in the U.S. and I, um, um, learned that, um, you know, thyroid ultrasound is a very, very, um, um, you know, important tool in the armamentarium of an endocrinologist. And I, I would like to always advocate um, that, you know, um, um, uh, we should, uh, you know, use the uh, thyroid ultrasound. We should learn how the ultrasound imaging can be utilized best to delineate all these thyroid lesions. Um, so, um, uh, while we talk about the utility of thyroid ultrasound, how we can differentiate nodular disease, benign, malignant, lymph nodes, vasculature, it's very, very important that we understand how, um, you know, the physics um, behind the thyroid ultrasound, the ultrasound works. And this is important because uh, when you're doing it in real practice, it helps you with the probe selection, you know, how you can optimize or play with the knobs on the machine, how you can actually optimize the image uh, um, creation. And then, you know, um, on the grayscale imaging, there might might be like, you know, like I tell it to people, they're all different shades of gray. So, um, you know, how would you identify what is an artifact and what is a true um, disease? So uh, very important to understand this physics. Um, but I'll I hope I'd be able to make it simpler for people to understand. But to start with, ultrasound essentially is a mechanical longitudinal pressure wave with a frequency which is above the human audible range. So which basically means that you're talking about frequencies which are more than 20 kilohertz. Um, now sound requires a medium to travel and that is where the importance of placing the gel comes. So um, the, the acoustic gel uh, gives these sound waves a medium to travel from the transducer into the thyroid tissue. Now for the use of uh, ultrasound in the medical world, um, we usually use frequencies that may be ranging from two megahertz to 16 megahertz. Now, um, how, um, how are these ultrasounds uh, produced? Uh, so that is where the role of the transducer comes. Uh, so transducer is the most important uh, tool uh, when you talk about um, uh, you know, generation of um, ultrasound waves and you know, um, uh, when you're talking about specific frequencies uh, that may be important for, utilize, for um, you know, delineating any uh, specific tissues. So <clears throat> if I could unmask this, um, 
uh, transducer, this is how it looks as shown in the picture here, that um, uh, the, the most important uh, um, element of the transducer is the piezoelectric element. This essentially utilizes the piezoelectric effect and um, it is sandwiched between the electrodes and the backing layer. So uh, how are these ultrasound uh, waves uh, produced? So um, piezoelectric effect implies essentially that um, um, you can produce uh, ultrasound waves by passing an electrical current or a signal through um, a specific material, which is called as the piezoelectric material. The reason it is um, you know, important to know because this specific material is the one which actually expands and contracts with this electrical current being um, um, uh, applied and that travels as um, uh, sound waves. So um, the most um, uh, commonly used crystal that we're talking about, the piezoelectric crystal in the ultrasound transducers is a synthetic ceramic material. Most often, uh, often it is the lead zirconate titanate. So uh, this uh, I hope will make it easy to understand that there is an ultrasound machine uh, which utilizes the transducer uh, which has the piezoelectric crystal. Application of the electrical current to, to this piezoelectric crystal causes it to vibrate, and this generates the ultrasound waves. These ultrasound waves travel through the medium, the gel, and then hit the corresponding tissues, and they are reflected, which again comes back to the transducer. So the transducer is essentially the receiver of these uh, sound waves, the reflected sound waves as well again causes the crystal to vibrate and this in turn generates electrical current. Now that is perceived by the ultrasound machine and then um, this generates a, a, a picture. So this is the ultrasound machine. And um, if I had to simplify, I could just say that ultrasound is machine essentially is converting these sound waves into the 2D image as seen in the picture here. So, um, <clears throat> Um, the key parameters, uh, you know, when you're talking about these ultrasound waves, you know, the key parameters that we look for, uh, they include the frequency of these waves, the wavelength, which defines the resolution of the image, the velocity with which they travel, which helps identify the location of these lesions, um, the power and the intensity. Now, the two key words, um, you know, I could go deep into physics, but I'd uh, uh, stick uh, to more clinical aspects of um, the use of ultrasound. So the two key aspects, um, you know, when you are um, um, choosing, say, an ultrasound probe is essentially that, um, you know, these two words, frequency and resolution. Now, a frequency affects the quality of the ultrasound image. So the higher the frequency of the transducer probe, the better will be the picture, the better will be the resolution. The lower the frequency, the lesser will be the resolution. And, um, uh, and it's vice versa as well. So um, the, the, um, the better your resolution is going to be, the depth perception will be less the lower um, the resolution will be, the more is the depth of the image that you can capture. So to say there is a 12 megahertz transducer, he, it has a very good resolution. You can see it, um, the superficial structures very nicely, but it may not be able to capture very deep images. So it cannot uh, penetrate very deep. Whereas if you have a three megahertz transducer, which is a lower frequency, um, it, um, the resolution may not be as clear, but it can travel great depths. So we utilize this when we are actually um, uh, looking for structures which are deeper um, to the skin. So like say abdominal probes usually have a lower frequency compared to the probes that we use for um, superficial structures like thyroid. Um, now the ultrasound, uh, um, the waves as they are um, you know, traveling, they are reflected off the tissues. And um, this reflection is essentially a measure of acoustic impedance. The acoustic impedance essentially means the resistance that a tissue is posing uh, to the sound waves. And so the more the acoustic impedance is, more dense um, the particular, a particular tissue is, more the sound waves are going to be reflected back. And um, you know, this differentiation is important because that is what outlines you know, all these different tissues in the body have different densities. And this is how we can utilize the ultrasound for delineation of these um, um, you know, individual tissue surfaces, the interfaces essentially, I should say, that these reflections are coming from the interface of two tissues 
issues. So uh, the difference of the acoustic impedance, the difference, uh, you know, in the density of the two tissues determines how much sound wave is going to be reflected. And so the greater the change um, of the acoustic impedance, more the signal is going to be reflected. And that is what we see uh, on a grayscale imaging, different shades of gray, as we call it, um, help us define, you know, which tissue is more dense, which tissue is less dense, and, um, you know, identify the tissue structures. So um, these reflected echoes, um, you know, uh, could be categorized as hyperechoic. Hyperechoic means, um, you know, when we are looking at brighter images compared to the surrounding uh, tissue. Hypoechoic, which is less bright compared to the surrounding tissue. Isoechoic essentially means, um, you know, which is similar to the, um, you know, surrounding tissue. And anechoic means, which um, uh, does not um, uh, uh, reflect any, um, uh, uh, sound waves. So we're specifically talking about um, the use of ultrasound in the uh, thyroid imaging, uh, uh, when we look at the transverse section of, um, you know, uh, the thyroid uh, on an ultrasound, we see that, uh, and I'll show this again in a, uh, slides uh, later on, that the air filled trachea actually does not transmit any ultrasound waves. So we see that there, um, if you can see it in the picture here, what you see is the bright um, uh, curve here is actually the cartilaginous ring of the trachea. The sound waves essentially come travel from um, the skin down and they are reflected um, uh, up um, because cartilage actually does not let, um, you know, um, the sound waves travel through the tra trachea. So this, that is why you see a significant bright um, um, a reflection here. And then there is uh, a dampening of um, the sound waves here, which is outlined by the darker area, the U-shaped darker area, which signifies the presence of the trachea. Um, the fluid fill structures, they form uh, an echo-free appearance. So like um, in this picture, I wanted to show here, this is uh, most likely a cyst around here. Uh, it's a fluid filled structure. Um, the blood vessels also look, um, you know, echo um, um, uniform, um, echo free on the thyroid imaging. And then the tissue structures, as we see here and here, um, the muscles here, um, the tissue structures and the organs have a ground glass appearance. And this may uh, appear of different intensities depending on the um, density of the tissue. So uh, another important thing, uh, which is important with all this, I essentially wanted to come to the point that the most important thing in, um, you know, performing ultrasound is probe selection. So that probe, the transducer is the key to, um, you know, um, um, you know, uh, doing a good ultrasound. So because the, that is where the physics is applied, uh, you know, we, we want to know what is the tissue we want to image. We want to know what is the frequency of um, the probe that we want to select to, to um, um, you know, picture that particular tissue. So um, most important here is the frequency of the probe. Um, the resolution defines how clear the picture would be. And that is what I wanted to say essentially that higher the frequency of the probe, the clearer the picture will be. The lower the frequency of the probe, um, there is going to be poor resolution, but you are able to go a larger depth into the tissue to pictureize it. So these are the three commonly used uh, transducer probes um, in clinical practice. Um, the three basic types of probes are the linear probe, the curvilinear probe, and the phased array probes. Um, so uh, I wanted to outline the fact that uh, the one that we use in um, thyroid imaging is the linear probe, which is uh, designed for more superficial imaging. It has a frequency in anywhere in the range of 5 to um, 14 megahertz, has a better resolution um, uh, at the cost of less penetration or depth perception. Um, uh, essentially, um, you know, um, the crystals, the piezoelectric crystals, probe here is um, 2 to 4 megahertz, and this is utilized for abdominal structure imaging. The phased array microscope is, usu is usually used in the cardiology world for imaging. So um, again, to reiterate the fact um, that, um, you know, lower frequencies are used for general abdominal examination, whereas um, higher frequencies to the order of 7 to 12 megahertz may be utilized for thyroid imaging. Um, a quick word about the main imaging modes that we utilize um, in thyroid um, ultrasound um, or in the world of ultrasound are the A mode, the B mode, and the M mode. Uh, what we utilize um, is the B mode, which stands for the brightness. It gives 2D information about the structure. Um, and um, uh, we also utilize the Doppler mode uh, to study the uh, blood vessel um, you know, anatomy and the flow. Um, 
the M mode is you is used, um, you know, to detect motion. So mostly used in the world of cardiology. So how is the test performed? Um, essentially, it's an office procedure. No special preparation is needed. You have the patient lie down supine with a neck hyperextended. So we could usually use a small pillow or, or a towel roll that can be put under the shoulder and the neck such that the neck is a little hyperextended. And then we use the acoustic gel, as I mentioned before, because we need a medium for the sound waves to travel. Um, and um, the transducer probe used for thyroid ultrasound is usually uh, um, in for a higher frequency in the order of 7 to 15 um, um, megahertz. And then the neck is scanned in both transverse and longitudinal planes. Um, slower uh, thyroid gland, we can have, you know, uh, patients, you know, either swallow to facilitate the elevation of the lower portions of the thyroid gland, or, you know, have them swallow, um, you know, a little bit of water to uh, see the esophagus moving. And then you can also use a valsalva man maneuver to distend the jugular veins. Um, so while we talk about the ultrasound, it's very, very important that we are able to relate it with the anatomy of the thyroid gland, because that is what will help us identify you know, the structures, um, you know, when we are doing the thyroid ultrasound as to, you know, where they are located and what significance it may carry. So um, thyroid gland is situated in the anterior part of the neck, um, essentially um, right below the thyroid um, um, uh, uh, cartilage. And um, um, in fact, the isthmus covers the tracheal second and the third ring. It consists of uh, two lobes, um, which is the right lobe and the left lobe, and uh, it comes together um, by, um, you know, with a bridge connection, which is called as the isthmus. Now, um, usually the superior pole of the thyroid is much more narrower, and uh, the lower lobes, uh, the lower portion or the lower pole of the um, lobes is usually more uh, pear-shaped. Um, now, uh, what is important to uh, realize is that um, if you look at the posterior aspect of the thyroid, and now two key structures that we need to be mindful of is um, the presence of parathyroid glands. So there are four parathyroid glands, um, you know, um, uh, two uh, uh, on the back of each lobe. Um, it's very important to know their location or identify their location. On a thyroid ultrasound, um, usually we're not able to see the parathyroids very clearly unless and until they're enlarged. Um, but it becomes very important, um, you know, say if the patient is going for thyroidectomy or any other intervention to identify these parathyroids so that we can save them. Uh, the other important structure which goes um, behind the um, thyroid is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Again, the anatomy is important because it can get compressed with thyroid enlargement. Um, and uh, that is what contributes to the hoarseness that some of our patients complain, um, you know, um, uh, off with goiter. So um, this is a picture of a transverse ultrasound scan of a normal thyroid. Um, and this is how it um, you know, corroborates with the anatomy. So what I wanted to show here is that, um, as I mentioned before also, this is the skin and this is where the sound waves are traveling through. Um, it traverses the thyroid isthmus here and then bounces off the cartilaginous ring of the trachea which is what causes a posterior signal dropout. And what we see here is no shadows here. So, um, and then um, this is the right lobe of the thyroid and this is the left lobe of the thyroid. What we see here, the anechoic um, structures here correspond to the blood vessels, the common carotid artery and the, um, the internal jugular. Um, this is important to identify here that these are the strap muscles. Uh, so strap muscles essentially lie um, anteriorly to the thyroid. We have the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which is a more anterolateral to the thyroid. And then, um, you know, this is where the esophagus may be to, towards the left um, uh, of the picture. And this is the longest coli muscle. Uh, when we do uh, a longitudinal overview of the ultrasound uh, image of the thyroid, uh, again, important to identify um, that these are the little tracheal rings here. Uh, this is the overlying sternocleidomastoid muscle, the strap muscles, and this is um, the, uh, the left lobe of the thyroid gland, the superior pole being here and the inferior pole being here. Um, so as I mentioned already, uh, you know, anteriorly we have the strap muscles, um, posteriorly we have the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage and the trachea, 
Um, posteromedially, we have the tracheoesophageal group, which contains lymph nodes, recurrent laryngeal nerve, the parathyroids, and we posterolaterally, we have the carotid space. Now, one important thing to um, identify is, um, you know, pyramidal lobe. Um, um, the pyramidal lobe is essentially an embryonic remnant of um, the thyroglossal duct. So um, basically, as the thyroid is developing from the base of the tongue, um, um, the, um, uh, the remnant actually fails to uh, regress. And this is what remains um, as a finger-like projection, which comes out of the isthmus as we see it here. And now this is significant because a significant number of uh, patients actually have uh, the pyramidal lobe. And this is important for identification, especially if the patient may be going for um, you know, procedures like total thyroidectomy. So the cadaveric prevalence is up to 30 to 55%, uh, sonographic prevalence of 15 to 20%. Um, as seen on the ultrasound here, um, this is the pyramidal lobe. Um, which is occupied um, in the isthmus um, of the thyroid gland. On a longitudinal view, we see um, this is where the pyramidal lobe is. So um, another important thing is how do we measure um, the thyroid? So um, in the transverse view, we um, essentially um, um, you know, measure the depth and the width. So uh, while we are moving the ultrasound probe, we find where um, the thyroid lobe looks the fleshiest, and that is where we want to take our um, measures. Um, so uh, the measurements, the depth can also be calculated in the longitudinal view, um, but um, it depends on the operator. So um, uh, in the, um, the fleshiest part of um, the thyroid uh, lobe, we actually uh, calculate the depth and the width is calculated uh, by dropping a line which is perpendicular or at 90 degrees um, to the depth. Um, then in the, in the um, longitudinal view, we measure the anterior posterior length um, of the thyroid. Um, the usual uh, gland measures are length is four to six centimeters, depth is about two, uh, less than two centimeters, isthmus is less than uh, five millimeters. Um, volume um, can be calculated um, 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 uh, for the thyroid. It's usually 10 to 15 ml for females, 12 to 18 for males. Um, so usually, we've, uh, we don't find much clinical utility for calculation of thyroid lobe volumes, except for when we are evaluating, say, uh, the need for radioactive iodine, we are evaluating, um, you know, uh, the presence of goiter for the patients. Um, the echogenicity, a word about the echogenicity, uh, the normal thyroid gland is less echogenic um, than the adjacent subcutaneous fat and more echogenic than the surrounding muscles. So um, it appears to be homogenous and it has a similar echogenicity to the submandibular gland. So I'll show a quick comparison here. So um, this is the normal thyroid gland. Look how homogenous it looks, all one shades of gray. And then if you look at the strap muscles here, it appears to be brighter than these strap muscles. Uh, and that is, that, that is significant because that is how we identify the thyroid gland in relation to the strap muscles and the density. Uh, now, sometimes if you're having difficulty in, uh, in locating the thyroid gland, you can also actually move up your thyroid ultrasound probe and go up to the submandibular gland because submandibular gland essentially looks the same um, when you could talk about echogenicity um, you know, um, compared to thyroid. So um, on the left side, of, on the right side of the screen, what we see here is a much heterogeneous look, um, different shades of gray, um, you know, as um, I would like to call it. Um, um, and so usually may signify, um, you know, multinodular disease or uh, more like a Hashimoto's kind of a picture. Um, I mentioned the use of Doppler ultrasound as well. So um, um, uh, vascularity uh, for a normal thyroid gland looks something like this. Um, and then again, vascularity finds a way because, you know, especially like the other picture I'll show you, um, a significantly um, increased vascularity signifies the presence of hyperthyroidism, a Graves-like picture, thyroid inferno as we were looking at this picture. And then it's also helpful to delineate uh, vasculature in the lymph nodes because it also helps us identify benign versus malignant nodules. Um, a last word about uh, the fact that, you know, as I encourage endocrinologists, uh, you know, to uh, pick up the ultrasound probe and, you know, do um, the, um, you know, ultrasound imaging, it's also important that we should know how to report the thyroid ultrasound. So um, uh, when you are um, chalking out a report for the thyroid, it's important uh, to delineate these uh, specific um, 
you know, points uh, on the ultrasound report. So what is the device being used? What is the size of the gland? Mention individual sizes of the lobes. Uh, what is the size of the isthmus? How does it look in terms of echogenicity, vascularity? If there are any focal lesions, where are they present? Which lobe are they present? What is the size? Again, mention the, the width, depth, and the length. Uh, evaluate for the uh, cervical lymph nodes. Uh, look at the lymph nodes, comment on their size, comment on their vascularity, uh, presence of, um, you know, high limb. And then in the conclusion part, mention, um, you know, uh, the TIRADS uh, category and any recommendations based on um, the ultrasound performed. So with this, I would like to end my talk, um, you know, um, um, I would be um, happy uh, to take um, any questions um, at the end of the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Brinda, for making the physics uh, look very uh, uh, easy. So now I'll be, uh, I hope everyone can uh, see my presentation. Can you hear me? Am I audible, Dr. Brinda? Hello? Can you hear me? Um, yes, yes, yeah, Dr. Yeah, Sathar, I yeah, yeah, okay, I'll. So, welcome everyone again. Uh, so, my talk is uh, mostly images. So, I'll be talking and I'll be running you across the images and how to interpret these uh, ultrasound uh, images. So, this is basically a basic course, and these are the important features of the thyroid gland, that is the composition, echogenicity, calcification, shape, the margins. These are the most important and the other uh, less important ones are the halo and the color Doppler. So first I will be telling you about the composition. Composition means uh, here, as you can see, this is for pictorial purpose. This is uh, when a nodule looks somewhat like this, that means the entire nodule is solid or more than 95% uh, solid. Uh, it is called a solid lesion. And the nodule can be uh, having a mixed, this is the solid component here. And then uh, this blackish one uh, is the cystic component. So this is a mixed solid and cystic lesion, or you can have a lesion like this, which is a cystic lesion, or you can have a spongy form nodule, uh, which appears uh, like the cut section of a sponge, wherein more than 50% uh, of the nodule uh, will have a small a cystic spaces. So this entire uh, thing is the thyroid uh, gland and you can see there is a nodule inside. This nodule is a solid uh, uh, nodule. And uh, similarly, you can see the same thing here. It is a solid uh, lesion. And here you can see this is the nodule here, the circular, uh, this entire thing is the nodule and the black spots are the cystic components and this is the uh, solid component. So this is a mixed lesion called a solid and uh, cystic uh, lesion. Similarly, you have uh, one more lesion here. This entire thing is the uh, thyroid gland and you have a nodule here. This nodule shows the solid component and this black part is the cystic component. So this is again a mixed solid and uh, cystic lesion. So now this is a classic uh, spongy form uh, nodule where you have multiple uh, tiny uh, cystic uh, lesions separated by these bands. And uh, they have more than, uh, they occupy more than 50% of the nodules. And this is one more uh, spongy form nodules. These spongy form nodules are uh, classically uh, benign and they can just be uh, kept on follow up. So now to compare with the anatomy here, so as you can see, this is the normal uh, thyroid uh, gland and this black thing is the thyroid uh, cyst uh, because the sound as Dr. Brinda has uh, said, it freely process through the fluid where uh, here you have a lot of colloid and posteriorly you can see this whitish hue there that is the posterior acoustic enhancement. Now we go on to the ultrasound image. This is the uh, outline of the thyroid uh, gland, and then you have a uh, cyst here. This is the cyst with the posterior acoustic enhancement. These are all benign things. 
So one more uh, cyst, similarly, this is the thyroid gland, which is represented in this uh, image on the right anatomically. And this is uh, the ultrasound picture. These, are, these cysts are roundish or oval in shape. They are regular, well-defined, anechoic, and have a posterior acoustic enhancement. Now, when you look at the risk of cancer with regards to the uh, composition, here on the y-axis, you have the risk of uh, malignancy and on the, the y-axis, you can see that the solid component has higher risk of uh, malignancy compared to the mixed and the least is the spongiform nodules. So this is a study which we have done when I was in uh, CMC hospital uh, Velour. Uh, in that uh, study, the solid lesion has a sensitivity of 78% uh, with a specificity of 42% in predicting malignancy. Now coming to the ecogenicity, this is the second uh, important uh, feature, the ecogenicity of a nodule. As you can see in the image here, the entire thing, this is the thyroid gland and that is the normal ecogency. That's how it uh, looks like. There's a normal ecogenicity, uh, I, which is similar to the submandibular uh, gland. So, and this are the strap muscles here. That's how, that's the normal uh, ecogenicity of the strap muscles, uh, which is little uh, like this as shown here. So all other, this ecogenicity is uh, classified like isoechoic. That means if a nodule has similar uh, ecogenicity as this thyroid gland, normal thyroid gland, it is called isoechoic. Hyperechoic, it has increased inten uh, ecogenicity compared to the normal thyroid gland. Hypo, it is less compared to the normal thyroid gland. And a markedly hypoechoic, uh, it is less echogenic even to the strap muscles. If the echo is less than the strap muscles, we call it as hypo, markedly hypoechoic. So just to re revise again, this is an anechoic where the sound waves just pass through and you have the posterior acoustic. This is a thyroid cyst. So this is an anechoic lesion. And now we discuss about the isoechoic lesion. On the left-hand side, you can see the normal uh, thyroid gland. And in that you have a nodule here. And this nodule's ecogenicity is similar to the ecogenicity of the normal thyroid. So this is a isoechoic, no, isoechoic uh, nodule. So this ecogenicity is compared to the normal thyroid tissue. Here again, this is the thyroid gland here. And this part is the nodule. So the ecogenicity of this nodule is similar to the sliver of normal thyroid tissue here. So this becomes an isoechoic nodule. And this is, as you know, is the carotid artery. So again, coming to the hyperechoic uh, lesions. So this entire thing is the thyroid gland. Inside that, you can see a nodule here. And the ecogenicity of this nodule is higher compared to the normal thyroid tissue. This is the ecogenicity of the normal thyroid tissue. And you can see this, this is the hyperechoic thyroid nodule. Most of these hyperechoic nodules are usually benign. Now we'll discuss about the hypoechoic uh, nodules. So this is, again, we go back to the anatomy. As you can see, this is the uh, thyroid gland here, similarly, this part is the thyroid gland and there is a nodule here. This nodule's ecogenicity is less compared to the normal thyroid tissue here. So this part is the normal thyroid tissue and you, the ecogenicity is lesser compared to the normal thyroid tissue. These are called hypoechoic uh, nodules. So when the ecogenicity of the nodule is less compared to the normal thyroid tissue, usually we check the uh, ecogenicity on the ipsilateral side, if, if it is not available, then we check on the contralateral side. Even then, if the entire gland is abnormal, then we have to compare it with the normal submandibular gland. So this is a hypoechoic nodule. These hypoechoic nodules are suspicious. So this is one more hypoechoic nodule, as you can see here. And the hypoechoic nodule have a, has a median sensitivity uh, ranging from 48 to 90% and with a median specificity of 82 to 93%. So similarly, in our study, uh, the sensitivity was 63% uh, 
with a specificity of 82%. So now this is markedly hypoechoic. So here the entire thing is this thyroid, sorry, the entire thing is a thyroid gland and this little bit is the normal thyroid tissue here and the entire this part is the markedly hypoechoic. If you compare the echogenicity of this, it is in fact lesser than the strap muscles. So these are called markedly hypoechoic nodules. They are highly suspicious for malignancy. So this is an other hy markedly hypoechoic nodule here. So the markedly hypoechoic nodules, they have a less sensitivity, but their specificity is usually more than 90% in predicting malignancy. So how do you uh, look for the echogenicity in a solid and cystic lesion? When you have a solid and cystic lesion like this, wherein this part is the anechoic cystic part, so you have to look at the echogenicity of the solid component here. So the echogenicity of the solid component in this nodule is comparable to the normal thyroid tissue here. So this becomes a isoechoic nodule. And here, this is the thyroid lobe here. And inside that, you can see a hypoechoic nodule, which, which intensity, uh, whose uh, echogenicity is less than the thyroid. So this is a hypoechoic nodule. But sometimes these hypoechoic nodules can have this posterior acoustic enhancement. And if you want, if you have a doubt whether it is a cystic lesion or not, the important thing is to just switch on the color Doppler. And if you have a uptake like this color Doppler, then definitely this is a suspicious uh, nodule, the hypoechoic nodule. So this is called a nodule in a nodule appearance. Here uh, to demarcate this part is the nodule here. And this sliver of normal thyroid tissue is here in the end on the left-hand side. So the echogenicity of this nodule is sort of this as two echogenicities. One, the, this rest of this part looks like uh, isoechoic to the thyroid with little bit of spaces here, but this part is hypoechoic to the rest of the thyroid gland. So this is called a nodule in nodule uh, appearance. The nodule in nodule appearance is uh, supposed to be a transformation from benign and uh, this uh, can be seen in a subset of follicular carcinomas. Now we will discuss about the punctate echogenic foci. These punctate echogenic uh, foci are classified into comet tail artifacts, macro calcifications, micro calcifications, peripheral calcifications, which can be complete or partial. So coming to the comet tail artifacts, here this is the thyroid nodule here, and this is the tracheal uh, ring. Inside this nodule, you can see a lot of anechoic uh, spaces here. And there, inside this anechoic spaces, you can see this sort of a lesion. These are called comet tails, which are tail here. And this, uh, so this is typical of a benign colloid uh, cyst. These comet tail artifacts are uh, benign. And uh, they, they actually represent the, uh, they are actually the reverberation uh, artifacts of the colloid. So this is another example of a comet tail, uh, which is uh, benign. Uh, sometimes in some nodules, you may see like this lesions, they, they look like uh, comet tails, but they are actually not uh, comet tails. These comet tails have to be uh, seen in a cystic part uh, like this. When you see the comet tails in a hypoechoic uh, lesion or a solid lesion, they are highly suspicious. This is actually a, a papillary thyroid carcinoma on the right side. Macro calcification. So here, if you can see this whitish thing is the macro uh, calcification here. In the, whenever there's a macro calcification, they are usually more than a, a millimeter and they have this posterior acoustic shadowing. That means the sound waves can't pass through this uh, macro calcification and you get this posterior acoustic shadowing. Similarly, here also you have 
this is the macro calcification and you have a posterior acoustic shadowing so this is a significant for and is suspicious for malignancy so now we'll discuss about the micro calcification here this is the thyroid uh, gland that you see and inside that you have a lesion here this is the nodule the nodule has cystic component that is the anechoic part here and and also there is a solid component here so this solid uh, component ecogenicity is similar to this so isoechoic but you see this small punctate ecogenic fossa this whitish things are the micro calcification these typically are a measure they measure about a millimeter and they don't have any uh, distal acoustic shadowing uh, like the macro calcification and they are supposed to be the aggregates of samoma bodies bodies they are highly suspicious for malignancy so when you look at the sensitivity of micro calcification is around uh, 70% with a specificity of 66% There's another calcification called peripheral uh, calcification where you have this blackish thing is the posterior acoustic uh, shadowing. This also is suspicious. Initially, they thought this eggshell calcification, that means the entire nodule gets calcified like this. Eggshell calcification is uh, benign, but whenever you have a break in the eggshell like this as you can see this is the calcification and there's a break in the eggshell calcification this is highly uh, suspicious and whenever do you we do a fine needle aspiration we have to target through this angle to get the exact tissue now we'll discuss about the shape of the thyroid gland uh, of the nodule so for representation purpose, this is the ultrasound image and the shape is measured in the anterior posterior direction and the transverse direction like this. This is the anterior posterior and the transverse side. They are classified into wider than tall. So wider than tall is anterior posterior dimension is less compared to the transverse direction. They are generally oval in shape or you have what is called taller than white. Taller than white means the anterior posterior dimension, this to this is more compared to the transverse dimension. That means the nodule is going growing against the tissue planes. That these are suspicious for malignancy. So here, this entire thing is the thyroid gland on the right side, and you have a nodule here. The nodule is well-defined, uh, but it is not the only uh, feature which uh, determines the malignancy. You have to add up all the other features to calculate the risk, which will be described in the next talk. So this is a taller than wide lesion. The entire thing is the left lobe of a thyroid, and this is the nodule here. The anterior posterior diameter is greater than the transverse diameter. So this is a taller than white and the ratio of the anterior posterior is, uh, is greater than uh, one and this is associated with malignancy. This is an, again another anterior uh, wherein the anterior posterior dimension is more than the transverse uh, dimension. Taller than white lesions have less sensitivity in picking uh, this malignancy but they are very specificity. Specificity is more than 90%. Similarly, in our study, we had a sensitivity of 26.9% and the specificity was 90% in predicting malignancy. Now we'll discuss about the other important feature, the margins of the nodule. The margins of the nodule are divided whether they are into well-defined or poorly defined, irregular, lobulated or infiltrating. So here, this is, a, this is, a, this is the thyroid gland here and then you have a nodule here, the margins are fairly well defined, but this does not uh, exclude uh, malignancy. Even this uh, well-defined margins can be seen in encapsulated follicular variants of papillary thyroid carcinomas, Hertel cell cancers, and even in a small percentage of papillary thyroid cancers. So here uh, you can see this is the thyroid uh, gland and inside that you have a hypoechoic uh, lesion with a lobulated margin and some calcifications. 
So these lobulations, they are suspicious for malignancy. So this again is the lobulation, which is uh, suspicious for malignancy. And here, this is the thyroid uh, gland and you have a lesion which is hypoechoic, which has uh, irregular uh, margins as depicted here. It has irregular uh, margins and some calcifications. So this is suspicious uh, thyroid nodule. The irregular margins have a sensitivity uh, ranging from 17 to 88% with a specificity ranging from 62 to 85%. So in our study, the irregular or lobulated margins had a sensitivity of 46% with a specificity of 86%. Now, how do you comment on the margins in a solid uh, cystic lesions? In a solid cystic lesion, as you can see, this is the nodule here. And uh, these are the anechoic uh, spaces. And this is the solid lesion. So here, this solid uh, lesion, the margins you can see are uneven and they are irregular and they are suspicious. And they, the, we also have to look at the angle of contact of this uh, solid lesion with the uh, cystic wall. So they generally make an acute angle of contact and they are pedunculated like this. So this is highly suspicious and this is papillary. Uh, thyroid carcinoma. Comparing this with a benign colloid nodule on the right, here the margins are more even, they are broad based and the angle of contact definitely is more than 90 degrees. So this is a benign colloid nodule, whereas this on the left side is suspicious and it's a papillary thyroid carcinoma. So the other important uh, finding is the Halo. Halo is a rim around the nodule. So this is the thyroid uh, gland and you have a nodule here. So the rim around the nodule is called the halo. And it is probably supposed to uh, represent the compressed uh, perinodular uh, tissue or the blood vessels. So here you can see there's a thin, thin line. It's called a thin halo. Thin halos are usually uh, supposed to be uh, benign, whereas uh, thick halo. So here you can see this is the thyroid uh, gland and you have a nodule here and the margin of the nodule is thick compared to the previous one and it is irregular. So this thick and irregular uh, margins are suspicious and they can be seen in follicular or health cell carcinomas or adenomas and even encapsulated uh, papillary thyroid cancer. But this halo is not a very sensitive or uh, specific uh, uh, finding for describing malignancy. Now coming to the color Doppler, color Doppler, it helps us in uh, registering the blood flow through the uh, nodule. And uh, it is usually increased in a Graves disease like this, uh, where the gland is diffusely uh, hypoechoic heterogeneous gland. And uh, it has increased vascular supply. Uh, so it is called here, you can see this is uh, again called as a thyroid uh, inferno whereas the vascularity is decreased in subacute uh, thyroiditis. So in a benign nodule, here you can see this is a benign uh, uh, nodule and this is a, a vascularity is peripheral or perinodular vascularity. Perinodular vascularity is usually uh, considered benign, whereas in a malignant uh, nodule, the vascularity uh, is uh, intranodular vascularity, which is uh, more uh, significant, they can have uh, with or without perinodular vascularity. As described, uh, I mean, earlier, like halo, even the vascularity doesn't have high uh, sensitivity or the specificity in uh, predicting malignancies, but by and large, it is very useful. Like, in, in, particularly if you have a solid uh, cystic lesion like this, and where this part is the cystic uh, lesion, and this is the solid uh, uh, lesion here. And if you I, uh, if you would like to see whether this is important or not, you just switch on the color Doppler and you see the vascularity. When you have a vascularity within a, a solid component in a cystic, that, that, uh, that's a suspicious uh, lesion. Similarly, you have uh, here too, this is the sort of a pedunculated uh, lesion and you have a vascularity within this uh, uh, not a solid component, this again is suspicious. Sometimes you can have uh, this, I mean, it looks like a, uh, a honeycombing sort of a thing, but when you see the vascularity is there within this strand. So this is a suspicious for uh, thyroid carcinoma. So with this, I uh, end my uh, talk and we'll be happy to take the questions in the end after the next 
uh, presentation. Now I hand over the mic to uh, Dr. Uh, Srinivas Panja, sir. Sir. Hey Siddharth, how are you doing? Hi, sir. <laughs> okay. Give me one second. Okay. Uh, can, you, can you hear me, Siddharth? Yes, sir. I can hear you. Um, okay. Can you see my screen? No, sir. Maybe I have to take out mine, I suppose. Uh, so I'm just sharing my screen. Yeah. So, uh, can you see it? One second, I stopped sharing. Yes, sir, we can see your screen. Please go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you everybody for having me and greetings from uh, USA. I was supposed to be there in India today, but I think because of uh, all the infections, the flights got canceled. Um, so uh, very nice presentations by Rinda and uh, Siddharth, I think Rinda did a very good job to give the basics of what an ultrasound is. And I think you've seen some images with uh, Siddharth. Uh, I do think uh, thyroid is a very good tool for endocrinologists. Um, I've been uh, using an ultrasound machine for the past 15 years. I do about close to six to 10 ultrasounds a day. Um, and I do my own final aspiration. So I think it really helps uh, you as a physician and an endocrinologist, if you can look at the images yourself, follow them and uh, do your own needle aspirations. And certainly it improves the revenue as well. Yeah. What I'm going to do is um, very briefly look at how uh, the uh, images that Siddharth showed, you know, the characteristics of the images, how would you put them together uh, to figure out which nodule you need to biopsy, so in which nodule you just follow. So at the end of the day, I think when we do an ultrasound, we want to find out, uh, do I need to worry about the nodule or is it something I can just keep an eye on? Uh, so we'll look, look, look at those, um, the uh, TIRADS criteria, which you know stands for Thyroid Imaging Reporting and Data Systems, which was introduced in 2017. Uh, now this was done by the American College of Radiology. Um, you know, here in the US, we have a big fight in terms of who should be doing thyroid ultrasounds. You know, we as endocrinologists have been trying to take it out ourselves. Of course, radiologists don't want to leave it out. Um, so as endocrinologists, we actually do not use the thyroid system extremely widely. We do use the same characteristics, um, but most of the radiologists here uh, we'll use the tyrads when they report on the nodules. Uh, sometimes the tyrads gets a little difficult for um, the primary care physicians because they don't know what tyrad stands for and, and they, they get a little worried when there's a five millimeter tyrads for lesion and they recommend a needle aspiration. So I think that's where, you know, doing your ultrasounds um, helps so that when you have a small lesion, even if it looks suspicious, maybe you don't want to necessarily sample it. So we'll, we'll talk about the, uh, the, the tyrants as we go. So I'll have, I have quite a few images in there and uh, really uh, um, at the end of the day, seeing the ultrasound images by yourself as you do them is really going to help you figure out those uh, suspicious characteristics. Okay. Okay. So the next slide is uh, what I would spend a little bit time on uh, this pretty much uh, you know sums up most of the information about the tyrad system it looks at all the characteristics that siddharth had talked about the composition echogenicity shape uh, margin uh, how to put those points together and figure out which is a suspicious nodule which you want to sample and which you don't uh, so when it comes to composition uh, there is few of these characteristics. So is it cystic or almost completely cystic? Um, then it's zero points because most cystic nodules are uh, benign. Uh, you saw some of the spongiform. If, it is, if it's spongiform, it's zero points. If it is a mixed cystic or a solid nodule, if it's mixed cystic and solid, you get one point. And if it's completely solid or almost completely solid, um, it gets two points. 
if you go next to the echogenicity, uh, if it is anechoic, it is zero points. It is, if it is hyper or isoechoic, and I think you saw some of the images, and I will show some of these images as well. It'll be one point. If it is hypoechoic, it's two points. And of course, if it is very hypoechoic, that suspicious nodule, it gets three points. And coming to the shape, uh, as Siddharth mentioned, if it is wider than tall, it is zero points. Um, but if it is taller than wide, uh, it actually gets three points. Uh, and then uh, the margins, if it is smooth, zero points. If it's ill-defined, zero points. If it is lobulated or irregular, it's two points. And of course, if, if there is extrathyroidal extension, uh, the nodule gets about three points. And then uh, with the last one with echogenicity, you choose all of these that apply. Um, if there is no, uh, so these are echogenic material, if there's none or large comet tail artifacts, uh, like Siddharth mentioned, these are generally benign, so it's zero points. If it is macro calcifications, suspicious for sure, so one point. If it is peripheral rim calcifications, again, especially with the breaks in the nodule, it's two points. And then if you have the punctate, uh, calcification of the echogenic foci, it's about three points. Um, so all of these points together will determine, will determine the tyrad's level. So if it is a zero point, then it's a tyrad one or TR1. Uh, that's pretty much a benign nodule. So essentially that would be a completely cystic nodule, which is anechoic. It is wider than tall, it is smooth, and there is no artifacts or no echogenic material or there's some common tail artifacts. So if you have some of that nodules, these are benign, you do not need to do an FNA. If it is a tyrates two, uh, that is two points. These are typically also not suspicious. So you don't need to do an FNA on them. You can follow them. Um, then if it is three points, it comes to a mildly suspicious tyrates three. Um, the general recommendations is if these nodules are more than 2.5 centimeters, uh, you sample them, do a fine needle aspiration. If they're, if they're uh, between 1.5 to 2.5 centimeters, then you follow them. So if it's less than 2.5, you do a follow-up ultrasound. And now the tyrates four is anywhere from four to six points. So these are moderately, moderately suspicious. Um, so for these, if these nodules are more than 1.5 centimeters, you sample them, if they're less than that, you follow them uh, with follow-up ultrasounds. And then the tyrates five, these are seven points or more. These are highly suspicious. You certainly sample them if they're more than one centimeter. If they're uh, less than one centimeter, then you can follow them depending upon how suspicious it looks like. Uh, so this, this is uh, how the tyrates is, you know, the, on, the, on the web there is, uh, nice calculation tools where you can just put those uh, points in and it gives you a score and it'll also give you a tyrates uh, level when you can figure out. Uh, but I think if you do your own ultrasound yourself, uh, eventually you'll be able to figure out which nodule looks suspicious and, and uh, which doesn't. So I'll go through some of these um, uh, features. So these, some of these slides are a repetition of what Siddharth showed. So. Um, Okay, so these are the categories we've talked about. So composition, which is you choose one, echogenicity, choose one, shape, you choose one, margin, uh, choose one which is more suspicious. And if you have some echogenic foci, choose all that apply. So if you have a rim calcification, um, choose composition to be solid and echogenicity to be isoechoic. If the margin cannot be determined, you have to choose as ill-defined. If you're not sure of the echogenicity, just choose those most uh, isoechoic. If composition uh, cannot be determined, choose solid. So again, once again, these are some of the um, images which Siddharth also showed. So this is an example for uh, a cystic or a completely cystic nodule. And you can see some of the comment uh, echogen echoes in there. Uh, but these are very benign nodules, completely cystic or, or almost completely cystic. Uh, so this is a, another example of the spongy form nodules. 
And these are composed predominantly of tiny cystic spaces. Uh, spongiform is a benign finding. If there is a concern for irregular margins or suspicious foci, reconsider your choice of the spongiform. So uh, these are all several examples of spongiform, though, you know, the right lower kind of looks a little suspicious, but I think those are uh, common tail artifacts as well. So this is um, an example of a solid or a completely solid uh, nodule. Um, so looks fairly big on the left side. Uh, it's uh, composed entirely or nearly entirely of soft tissue with only a few cystic spaces. Um, but because it is predominantly solid, you would categorize it as a solid nodule uh, when you're doing your uh, scoring. Uh, so this is a, a mixed cystic solid. So you have you know, for some nodules greater than 50% cystic, for some nodules uh, more predominantly solid. So these are composed of soft tissue and cystic spaces. So this is an example of an anechoic nodule uh, without soft tissue component applies to cystic or completely cystic nodules. So, and this is a very nice example of a hyperechoic nodule. Again, these are typically benign nodules. Um, this nodule also has some cystic components to, his, to it. So this is, as you can see, compared to the rest of the thyroid, there is increased echogenicity. Uh, these are some examples of isoechoic nodules. Uh, so the uh, echogenicity is very similar to the rest of the thyroid gland. Uh, hypoechoic, always suspicious nodules. Um, uh, the echo is uh, hypoechoic, compared, hypoechoic compared to the rest of the thyroid gland. Um, these uh, certainly increase your risk in terms of malignancy. I think you, you can see in some of the nodules uh, calcification. In some of them, they have the rim calcification. Very suspicious nodules. Certainly, you would proceed to sample these nodules. Uh, and these are examples of very hypoechoic. Um, like Siddharth mentioned, the echogenicity is very similar to the strap muscles. Um, again, um, you can see perfect examples of irregular margins, very hypoechoic, extremely suspicious uh, nodules. You would certainly sample these nodules with a fine needle aspiration. Um, and then examples of some for the shape, so these are all examples of taller than wide nodules, um, and these certainly will get points on the thyroid system. Um, suspicious as well, and certainly these some of these also have irregular margins. So a taller than wide shape is defined as a ratio of uh, greater than one in the anteroposterior diameter to the horizontal diameter when measured in the transverse plane. So again, shape wider than tall. Um, wider than tall generally considered more benign. Um, a wider than tall shape is defined as a ratio of less than one in the anteroposterior diameter to the horizontal diameter when measured in the transverse plane. And I think, as I mentioned before, um, hopefully we'll get to a time where we can do these in person and uh, you all can do uh, ultrasounds hands-on. I think doing it and seeing it um, it helps a lot, and the more you see, uh, the more you can pick up, yeah, just like anything else. So coming to margins, uh, this is an example of a smooth margin, which is a it's uninterrupted, well-defined, curvy, uh, curvy linear edge, typically forming a spherical or elliptical shape. And again, you see some cystic areas in this nodule as well. Uh, and these are examples of the ill-defined margins, uh, irregular, ill-defined margins. Now, so for some nodules, we cannot do the margin, we cannot see the margins completely, you know, what we call the pseudo nodules. Um, those tend to be more in the benign. Uh, those tend to be more benign. Uh, so this is an example of an irregular margin. The outer part of the nodule is speculated, uh, irregular, sharp angles, uh, with or without clear soft tissue protrusions. So again, uh, suspicious nodule here, you can see some calcification as well. Uh, 
Margin here is lobulated. The margins has focal rounded soft tissue protrusions with action into the adjacent parenchyma. The lobulations may be single or multiple and may vary in uh, conspicuity and size. Uh, so these are extremely suspicious and certainly almost always malignant nodules. These are margins, nodules which have extra thyroidal extension. Um, so these for sure, you sample, if you sample for some reason you don't get a good result, you would still send them to Siddharth to have them removed because these um, look extremely suspicious. So that's where on the ultrasound, I think, uh, if it looks very suspicious, your needle aspiration doesn't always fit with your suspicion. Um, certainly, um, you know, talk to your um, surgeon to have it removed. And that is, I think, the, the other benefit of uh, doing your own ultrasounds is uh, you know your patient, you know your his or her risks, uh, as opposed to radiologists doing it where, unfortunately, they don't have the uh, background information of the patient's labs, um, family history, and et cetera. Uh, see, there, these are examples of echogenic foci. These are large common tail. Uh, I think Siddharth showed a few examples. These are a few more examples. Common tail artifact is a type of, uh, as um, when they also discuss reverberation artifact, uh, the deeper echoes become attenuated and are displaced as decreased width, resulting in a triangular shape. Uh, so these are macro calcifications. Again, we'll um, put your red flag up in terms of suspicious nodules, calcifications that are large enough to result in posterior acoustic shadowings. Uh, so these are peripheral calcifications, and I think Siddharth showed some nice examples as well. Um, calcifications occupy the periphery of the nodule, may not be continuous, but generally involves the majority of the margin. Often they're, often they're quite dense enough. Um, I have tried to sample uh, quite a few uh, nodules which have the rim calcifications. Uh, they tend to be extremely difficult at times, especially if you can't find a gap. Um, and you can almost literally, uh, you know, feel the calcium on those nodules. So some of these rim calcification nodules, very good to get, very difficult to get a sample. And again, if they're suspicious looking, you might want to just straight send them to the surgeon because you may not be able to get a good enough sample. Uh, so these are again examples of um, uh, the echogenic foci, punctate echogenic foci, dot-like lesions occasionally can have small common tail artifacts. And um, right at the bottom on the right, you can see the irregular solid um, component of the nodule. So, uh, you know, that's very briefly on the tie rads. Um, I think we'll... Uh, uh, open it up for uh, questions. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just put up the first slide which shows the uh, the tyrides um, sheet. Uh, but yeah, uh, that is um, the end of my talk, but I will um, give it over to Siddharth and yeah. Yeah, so it was a nice uh, lucid uh, presentation. So if you have uh, any uh, questions, we should be uh, able to answer. There's one in the chat. I think Dr. Ramya has uh, asked a question. So she would like to know the speak from the speakers, what are the practical constraints in acquiring an ultrasound machine and uh, performing scans of thyroid in India for physicians uh, and surgeons other than uh, the radiologists? So yeah, uh, coming to the ultrasound uh, machine, uh, anybody with a uh, MS or an MD gynae uh, degree uh, or even with an MCS degree, they can purchase an uh, ultrasound uh, machine uh, in India. And But you must uh, apply through the government uh, and get a PNDT uh, uh, certificate that you won't be doing the uh, scans to reveal. I mean, so those are the guidelines which we have to uh, follow. So here, I mean, uh, the, the purpose of this uh, course is uh, not to replace uh, the radiologists or uh, anything. Uh, as a surgeons or uh, physicians, uh, endocrinologists who are dealing with uh, thyroid uh, glands every uh, day, they should be able to uh, interpret the ultrasound uh, images by uh, themselves. And 
ultrasound is like a third hand uh, for the physicians dealing with thyroid disorders, or I can also say uh, like a stethoscope for the cardiologist or a echo like a cardiologist. So this has to be, everyone must have uh, in their uh, clinical uh, practice. Sir, would you like to say anything, Dr. Uh, Srinivas sir, Rakesh sir? So yeah, here, here it is um, a little e easier uh, in the US to get it. Uh, but I, I agree with what Siddharth said. I think uh, it, it's not to take anything away from the radiologists. Uh, and it's still a very small fraction of what radiologists do. Uh, but I think it really helps you as a physician uh, to kind of follow those nodules. You know, when you repeat them in a year or six months, you know, you've seen the previous images, you have them on file. Uh, I think continuity is much better with the ultrasound. And I think like that mentioned, it is really a very nice extra hand for endocrinologists. And uh, I agree, it's a must for any endocrinologist who deals with uh, thyroid or thyroid nodules. Uh, and it's and it, extremely helpful for us and the um, surg surgical colleagues because they get a whole lot more information when we do, when we do the ultrasounds ourselves. Yeah. So the next question is, uh, what are the sure ultrasound findings of uh, uh, malignant uh, thyroid selling? Sir, could you please answer that? Yeah, so, so as we sh saw in those slides, you know, if those nodules are more than 1.5 centimeters, if they're completely solid, if they have calcifications inside and they have an irregular margin, I think those absolutely, there's a more than 85% chance that these are malignant. And uh, these are those tyrides five. Uh, so for sure you would sample them. Um, yeah, and we always come with these fine needle aspiration reports, which most of the time are positive, but sometimes come and they say, well, they're atypical, but if you have these kind of lesions, even if you get an atypical FNA result, these I would send to the surgeon anyway, because uh, you've seen the images, they look bad, so the suspicion is high. So those are the almost certain features of malignancy. So, um, and there are you know a lot of the nodules always come in those you know gray area of the tyrides three and four, uh, which depending on the size you would still sample them. Yeah, yeah I so, hope that answers the question. Yeah, so I, I would just like to add on a couple of points to that, sir. So uh, it's not like a one finding uh, which we can just say that that is very uh, sensitive or uh, specific. That's where we have to combine all this, this composition, ecogenicity, shape, margin, and ecogenic foci. So you have to combine uh, all these nodules and the risk goes proportionate. As the number of uh, suspicious findings grow or go up, the suspicion also uh, goes up. And uh, there's a next question, sir. Uh, what do you do if you have a highly suspicious ultrasound nodule, but the FNAC uh, is benign? I had a case that uh, even had nodular metastasis. Yeah. So as uh, so shall I take this question? Please, yes. Yeah. If you have a highly uh, suspicious uh, ultrasound, but the FNAC is benign. So why does this happen? So this uh, can happen if you are not doing a guided uh, FNAC uh, and you don't have a on-site pathologist that the pathologist should be sitting with you when you are doing a needle aspiration and he'll tell you when you do an ultrasound and you feel that oh this looks suspicious and you do a needle uh, uh, FNAC and then you uh, know okay uh, you, if you hit the right suspicious nodule then it's unlikely to be benign. If you don't have a pathologist at your uh, disposition, then you may do, uh, or you are not using the ultrasound, you may sample the normal, like isoechoic part of the uh, nodule and not focus on the hypoechoic or the taller than wide lesion, then you may get uh, these samples. But whenever you have a high clinical uh, suspicion, like Dr. Uh, Panda has uh, suggested, you should refer to a surgeon. And if required, you can always, repeat the fine needle uh, aspiration cytology from the more suspicious uh, lesion. Or if you are convinced, then you can straight away go ahead with a 
uh, with the surgery, depending on the uh, clinical uh, scenario. So, sir, would you like to add anything to this, Dr. Brinda? Uh, no, no I, I, I agree. I think that's where I think if you do your own FNACs, uh, you can certainly you know sample the right portions of the nodule. But uh, yes, if it looks like cancer and smells like cancer, it's probably is cancer, even if the FNAC is negative. So, uh, if if it looks like it, just send them to Siddharth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dr. Vinda, would you like to add anything? I think I agree. Um, you know, for the most part, I think uh, ultrasound um, like guided FNA helps us in decision making, but eventually we should be guided by our instinct. You know, so as Dr. Panja said, that um, if it uh, looks and smells like one, then I think better to take it out. So um, I agree. Yeah. Dr. Rakesh Sai, sir, Dr. Sham, uh, would you like to add anything to this? Uh, Rather than adding, adding something, I think I need to go back to school again, medical school again. <laughs> so here in Idea Clinics, we have a, a on-site pathologist. When we do the fine needle aspiration, the pathologist is there right beside us. And the moment I do the FNAC, the pathologist has a look and says whether it is adequate. And, and in fact, he uh, rather gives me the report, hey, man, this looks like uh, malignant, or he says that this probably looks benign. And, I correlate it with my ultrasound findings. I really don't have to poke the patient one more time. If I know it looks benign and the pathologist says it's benign, I just have to stop with one or two pricks. So it's very helpful to have a team, uh, which is called ROSE, Rapid Onsite uh, Evaluation of the Fine Needle Aspiration Cytology. So we will go on to the next uh, question. Can you please explain again about the posterior acoustic enhancement. Thank you. Dr. Vrinda, could you please explain it again, the posterior acoustic uh, enhancement? Um, so essentially from, um, you know, how I would like to explain it is that, you know, if um, there is a fluid filled structure and there is something behind it, so the sound waves are going to easily cross through the cystic fluid, giving it a very dark uh, appearance on the echo and uh, or, or the ultrasound and then um, because the sound waves did not get dampened passing through that fluid so a larger portion of it is reflected by the structure which is behind it so uh, you see a much brighter image coming out at that intersection of a fluid filled structure as well as the tissue that is what is called as the posterior acoustic enhancement i, and I hope yeah. yeah and also about the posterior acoustic shadowing also if you could say it will be uh, so uh, the that is, uh, you know, so suppose if there is a, a denser material, so say like, you know, for example, the trachea. So, you know, the um, uh, a large portion of the ultrasound waves are going to reflect off a, a more denser material, like say a cartilage or a bone. So uh, anything which is posterior to that, there will be like a signal dampening. There essentially would, no be, would not be any transmission of the trans sound waves, which will give you this uh, shadowing, the darkness right behind a brighter spot. Okay, thank you. Dr. Panja, would you like to add anything? Uh, no, 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 I think. Yeah, uh, Rinda okay. explained yeah. It, uh, extremely <laughs> well. You know, we, we call it, we, we call those things as sometimes reflection artifacts, just like yeah. how Rinda said it reflects off. Okay, <laughs> so there's one more question. I think Dr. Panja, you should answer this. Your views on comparison between uh, ATA and ACR thyroids uh, for choosing nodules for FNAC and uh, which should be used? The views on so, comparison, yeah. So good good question. As I said, I actually, I know I did the talk on tyrads, um, but, you know, I don't use the tyrads that much. Uh, I would use more of the ATA guidelines and it goes mostly by, I mean, it still uses the same features. So I think um, wh whatever looks suspicious on, and the ATA looks suspicious on uh, the tyrants as well. And yeah. you know, tyrants was uh, to mainly give a more universal uh, approach to nodules where everybody can use it, um, you know, widely without having too many, uh, you know, changes. But, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think those five features of the nodule is what is going to you know, take you into the, whether you want to do a needle aspiration or not. They don't talk about, uh, you know, vascularity here, which I do use if it is, um, if it is, if there's a lot of internal vascularity in the nodule, 
uh, I, I tend to increase my chances of sampling it. And uh, one of the issue with the tie rods is, you know, you could have a small five millimeter nodule with the, with the tie rods five. And because it's the tie rods five, there's an automatic thing that says would recommend FNA. And, and that's where I think if you do your own ultrasound, you won't have that problem. I wouldn't sample a five millimeter nodule that's just too small. It doesn't matter how suspicious it looks like. Yeah. So that's a tough question, sir. <laughs> so, yes. yeah, I mean, uh, if you look at the, uh, like the sensitivity of the ACR tyrats is uh, low, but it is very uh, specific. Whereas the ATA, uh, the sensitivity is high and all the specificity is comparable to uh, ACR tyrats. But as Dr. Panja has said, at the end of the day, it is the five suspicious features on the ultrasound which determine which nodule uh, to do an FNAC or uh, not. So we'll go on to the next question. Uh, in this case, it was Bethesda 2 in FNAC. Uh, I think uh, this is probably the continuation. So what is your opinion about EU uh, tie rats? Dr. Brinda, Dr. Panja. So um, I haven't looked into the EU at all. So maybe Brinda can help out there. <laughs> Um, I agree. I, I have the same uh, like background for so I use like uh, in um, you know um, uh, as Dr. Panja said I'm grown I've grown used to using ATA and uh, ACR tie rats maybe in India a little bit more but I don't know much about the EU tie rats. I think the EU tie rats is almost uh, somewhat similar like our uh, ACA again as uh, Dr. Panja has said everything. Uh, revolves around these five features, that is the composition, ecogenicity, shape, margin, or ecogenic foci. I, as, uh, as clinicians, we should get used to these uh, findings, and as you do more and more, and you are comfortable, you can use whichever you want. Either you can use the risk pattern, the pattern based uh, by the ATA, or the ACR or EU tyrets. So I, either of these is fine. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think the key is, uh, yeah. really the key is to do. Uh, the more you do, the easier it gets. Uh, there is uh, no shortcut to yeah. you know, doing and looking at images constantly. And that gives yes. you... Yes, yes. So, there's one more question, sir. Comment till uh, seen into a solid nodule with small cysts or spongiform nodules are suspicious. So regarding the comet tails in a solid nodule with small cysts or spongiform nodules are suspicious. Dr. Panja, would you like to take this? So, so uh, yeah, I, I know, I'm not sure if I understood the question well, but yeah, if it is, little, yeah. so if it is spongiform and uh, again, same thing, the, if you see spongiform nodules, you know it is spongiform. Those are typically benign. Um, yeah. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, you know, in a solid nodule, if you're seeing calcifications, whether it looks like common tail or not, that's the, the suspicious. These are, you know, micro calcifications or micro calcifications. You auto sample these nodules. Uh, but spongiform is, you know, as you saw the pictures on there, it is very, very classic appearance. You can tell these are, you know, cystic areas within the nodules. It's like almost like layers of sponge. Um, uh, so you you shouldn't you should be able to differentiate spongiform versus a solid nodule which has um, calcifications within it. Yeah, that's true, sir. Sir, uh, can I ask Dr. Uh, uh, Sudhakar Rao sir and Dr. Rakesh Sai sir to give their comments? Sudhakar Rao sir. Yeah, yeah. Siddhar. Hi sir. Hi sir. Sir, you're valuable. It's a really very interesting. I am listening right from the beginning. And it, uh, for us, though, Dr. Sam has, as Sam has told, it is a, uh, we have to go back to the radiology <laughs> classes. Okay. But still, I, it is made easy. Brenda and yourself and Srinivas has made easy. It is interesting also. Okay. Uh, thank you. At least we can see the now ultrasound reports and uh, make the difference between a uh, cyst and uh, everything like that. Yeah. Okay, uh, like malignancy. 
and the orders we said usually we see the report only as a non endocrine sorry non ultrasound specialist we see the reports now we learn to see the complete uh, ultrasound report yeah thank you thank you sir sir uh, rakesh sir was as seen was as giant yeah. from the states thank you yeah yeah thank you thank you thank you rakesh sai sir uh, are you there sir Uh, now i ask uh, dr uh, sham sir if you could conclude this session if there are no more questions uh, thank you siddharth uh, thank you brinda and uh, uh, panja i think dr panja sinvas uh, is uh, in nepal as we speak is he planning to climb the himalayas is that what you are doing panja while we are working hard <laughs> so that is the plan for next week <laughs> unless unless flight get cancelled next week too so yeah, as of yeah next wednesday is when i leave oh, okay uh, okay i think uh, we can conclude now i think dr rakesh i is held up with some some other commitment it looks like yes sir uh, i'm not sure if he's uh, uh, still there uh, but i think uh, we had a very good session uh, some of the best talks we had uh, in the recent times uh we should probably congratulate all the faculty uh for all that uh, effort they put in uh, i think the topic is something uh, a deviation from the ever nonsense we get through covid talks so this is a refreshing uh, you know topic we discussed i think credit should go to uh, siddharth and brunda and uh, uh, obviously uh, the rest of the team mr avik uh, yes, raghav gautam and uh, many others who worked hard behind the scenes uh, i think uh, i would expect siddharth and brunda to continue this uh, legacy uh, in the coming months and uh, thank you uh, uh, everyone thank you thank you sir thanks a lot thank you uh, gautam avik and uh, raghav for this wonderful effort thanks a lot for all your coordination thank you we end this session thanks a lot thank you guys see you later See you, sir. See you. Bye, sir. Bye. Bye. Bye.